All right, first standalone review in a while, and it's for a great book, though. That's why I had to do this. It's one. Of, it's going to be one of my favorites of the year. It needs a standalone review. I need to just keep pushing this book on people, and that is Light from Uncommon Stars. <sighs> so good. I feel like I have done nothing but talk about this book for the past two weeks on this channel, and I honestly have no regrets. If you have not at least looked into this book yet at this point, what are, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, like I do in a lot of my review videos, I'll just talk about my general experience at the top. No plot, synopses, trope discussion, my, my rating of it, and then we'll get more into synopses, things that I thought it did really well. In particular, we're going to talk about themes and tropes that I think this book brings to the table and stuff that like I really love in my reading experience. And hopefully that gives you a sense of, well, do you love those themes and tropes? Should this be on your list, on your radar? Because honestly, I didn't know a lot about this book. Like I knew like snippets, like I heard the word donuts, you know, like, and there's like, you know, a space koi fish. Like I, but I didn't know a lot about it. I think when I watched Stephanie's vlog, I knew suddenly there was a music component. Like I knew little things, but I didn't know a lot other than the people who love it, love it. And then there were some people who didn't connect with it, which like that's a lot of books, but that's all I knew going into this. And I picked it up because it was nominated for the shortlist for the Hugos and a lot of my friends really like it. So it was like on my list twice over, but the Hugos was the thing that made me bump it up the TBR. And spoiler alert for my Hugo ranking video, this is my favorite, favorite one <laughs> on that list. I feel like I can't keep that a secret. Like that's just truly how I feel. This one was so so good. Um, so I went into it though, expecting to appreciate it. I just, I figured even if it didn't click with me, it was probably going to be a really unique time. And it was going to be something that I was like, huh, you know, I appreciate this. This is a good work of art sort of thing. That's what I was expecting based off the buzz I'd heard. And I love it. Five stars, almost teared up at the end, which like for me is essentially bawling crying for people who get emotional when they read works. Like I was emotionally impacted at the end of my journey with this story. And I started it with audio just because that's what I had. Um, and then I ended up immersion reading it just because I kept wanting to read it. So I didn't stop sometimes just doing audio because I just never wanted to stop reading this book. I just, I started it and I finished it in two days. And it's not that long of a book, but it's still like 370 pages. <laughs> And I was reading two other books that I was very, very into at the time. And they just had to be put on pause because even though I was really loving those books, this was an obsession. And what's interesting is that this is not a very plot driven story per se. It's actually a pretty quiet story. Like there are stakes. There is a reason to keep engaged with it, but it's not like a page turning thriller. It's not action packed. Like the reason I wanted to keep turning the pages is just because the writing worked so well and I was so invested in the situations of our characters. It just was the perfect experience for me. So that's this general gist. What is this about? <laughs> And primarily, it's about Katrina. Katrina is a trans woman who runs away from home because of her trans identity. She is abused at home because of it, and so she runs away. She is a violinist. She loves her music. She is self-taught. And in the process, she runs into a woman who is known for training the best violinists at a park. And this woman, she, we get a point of view from her, has made a deal with the devil and she is supposed to give them seven souls in 49 years she has given six she needs to give a seventh soul to the devil and it's usually people who are musical prodigies that she takes and trains up and then you know they exchange for a certain trait for fame or something they will give their soul to the devil this is what this woman does and she's fascinating you think you hear all that you just think oh that's our villain right wrong she is not the villain <laughs> she's amazing but that's like part of the story Another part of the story is we have this donut shop. And in this donut shop, we have an alien family of refugees who have run away from their empire and are currently working, you know, on making sure that their ships are up and running, that they have a gate while running a donut shop and trying to figure out why is our donut shop, technically it should be working, but it's not working that well. So you also have this refugee story. And then a small sub story is you have this woman who's taken over her family's repair shop, a violin repair shop. And it was always her grandfather's name and sons. And there's no sons left to take over. And she's the daughter. And so you see her journey in discovering that maybe this is a role that is meant for her, even if she's not a son. These are all of the players. This is all of the pieces that you follow in this story. And I love them all dearly. So <laughs> what are the themes? Or I guess let's start with what is the genre of this story? Like I've said deal with the devil and I've said aliens. Um, 
we're just going to call it speculative. <laughs> I think technically sci-fi is our closest. We use the most sci-fi stuff and I'm actually, you can't see it, but I am wearing my Star Trek shirt because it is referenced several times in the story. But there, you know, there's the supernatural quality of the deal with the devil. And honestly, all of that is aesthetic. Like I do think the sci-fi and quote unquote fantasy qualities are aesthetic. They are tropes you're comfortable with. They are kind of weird, but the main focus is truly the journeys of these individuals. You know, someone trying to figure out their family legacy, refugees running away to find a safe haven for their family. It's artists trying to connect with their art and be able to be in their own skin and feel safe and be unapologetic for it. It's these themes that make this story so rich. These are very human themes. These are very relatable themes that are just put in this kind of almost outlandish aesthetic that I love. It reminds me of the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once. They're not the same, but it's, it's the same type of discordant thing where I'm like, these are heavy themes. But also, this is an absurd sci-fi thing I'm looking at at the same time. It's that sort of dissonance that I felt like this story brought to the table. And I loved it. I loved it so, so much. I said I would mention some tropes. And that's what I'm going to do because this is another thing where I'm just like, oh, these are just things that I love as a reader. We have the mentor trope. So I talked to you about the woman who's made a deal with the devil. She's still a fantastic mentor in the way she takes Katrina in and takes care of her and advocates for her. Oh, if you don't feel things from their interactions, I don't know what's wrong. And what is amazing and fantastic is you would think, oh, deal with the devil, Katrina, the seventh soul. We're going to keep that hidden and there's going to be a betrayal. There is never miscommunication. This woman who makes deals with the devil, she is always upfront about her deals and what she brings to the table. She's not trying to hide who she is. She's not trying to hide the baggage she has, the darker sides of herself. I, I love her for that. I love that that wasn't the thing that caused the tension of the story. The tension of the story does not come from, oh, this mentorship mentee relationship. It's going to have this big betrayal moment. Oh no, they, you know, there's this trust that's formed and then it's broken. No, that's not where it comes in. And I love that personally. I, I get stressed by that. And like, there's still tension. There's still things to have happen because Katrina's life, it has so many other things she has to work through and deal with. Her life is so hard. <laughs> and so, you know, to just have a safe place to land for her, even if it comes with strings attached, it was just great. I just, I was able to sit in that and not be stressed from that, but I was stressed from other things. Like I really wanted Katrina to stop feeling so small, feeling like such a burden. Like I felt so bad for her. And so you get to see Katrina, once she has a place where she can thrive, where she can feel safe, grow, you can see who she could become. And it's really amazing, the discussion of music in this story. This is definitely a book that if you love music, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> like truly, at least for me, really captures the importance of music. And it's not even a classist way of doing it. It's not just about classical music and you need to like practice the greats. Like that's a part of it. Like you need to know your arpeggios and like stuff like that. Like there's a part of training. But like I said, Katrina is self-taught and she actually just wants to put videos online for animes and video games and how that's incorporated with the more classical sensibilities of her mentor. I loved it. I loved it a lot. I personally don't play violin. I play piano, clarinet, and saxophone, and I'm actually very classically trained in piano. And I learned a lot about violin. And this story made me go listen to a violin solo that she plays near the climax. If you love climaxes to be associated with music and music performance, very few are done as well as this one. Like, I truly loved that part of the climax was this music performance, the piece they chose and why they chose it, how it was narratively done on page, the purpose of it, how stressed you are because there is a lot of tension around this climax. Oof, it was, it was amazing. Um, I would also say there's a lot of found family, like truly so much found family um, between like the the aliens and how they interact with our because everything converges like our, our alien family does converge with our musical found family. And there are characters I haven't even mentioned and just the interactions between families, the bonds that are formed and how honest and you know, messy those bonds can be because again, there's still tension between these relationships, but it's not because of miscommunication. We again don't have the trope of, oh, these aliens are staying hidden. They will find out later that they are aliens and it'll be this big thing. No, it's pretty much from the get go. We know what's up. Like they're still hiding from like 
society, but not from like our other characters. But that doesn't mean things are perfect. There's still a lot of cultural miscommunication. And then one of our characters from the Donut family is really dealing with some PTSD and like watching her journey and figuring out how to protect her family without harming her family or with or taking care of herself and giving into her needs. It has sapphic relationships. It has great friendships. It's, it's a wonderful time. It's a wonderful time. It's emotional. It's hard. Uh, this is not an easy story at times. I really can't emphasize enough how difficult a lot of these situations are. In many ways, I feel like the aliens were put in to be an allegory to the experience of many refugees. Um, and that kind of also kind of comes full circle in the end in a way that like truly made my heart feel things. <laughs> um, and then Katrina herself, it's just not everyone who comes out as trans has a safe place to land initially and you truly see that in what Katrina goes through and then what Katrina continues to have to go through in a liberal part of the country. This takes place in California and the things that she has to go through in modern day California, like this is California, you know, we're not even talking about the states that are getting rid of health care for trans children. It's just... It's a lot, so make sure if you do have any content or trigger warnings around any of those themes, you look them up or you can ask me and I can tell you how graphic certain things were on page and stuff like that. But at the end, it is a story about finding where you belong, about coming to terms with who you are and being proud of that. And I love stories of healing and growing. It's just a thing I love. And so I love this story. I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> I've said that at least seven times. I wonder if I'll just have a counter in the video of how many times I say that. But if you made it this far, let me know. Have I convinced you to try this out? It's okay if I've convinced you that it's not for you as well, because this is a very specific flavor of what it is. It's, it's going to be an amazing experience for some people and a lackluster experience for others. It's not a book that I could just see that it has broad mass appeal. I truly see that in my reading experience, but man, was it the perfect weird thing for me at the time that I picked it up. And I can't wait to reread it one day because it was just fantastic. Um, if you just want to leave an emoji to let me know you're here, leave a donut because I haven't had a donut emoji left for this book yet. And otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.